Eileen, welcome to this podcast. This is Eileen Kelly. She's one of my good friends and she also has a podcast. I do. Do you want to plug it? Yeah, it's called Going Mental with Eileen Kelly. You can find it anywhere you can find a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Eileen and I have a lot in common. We both started on Tumblr. And we both have podcasts. This is our our, our gray area overlap. We both have nice. brown hair. We both have short brown hair. Yeah. We're and both wearing white. We're both wearing white. This is planned today. Eileen showed up in a medieval outfit. I did. And it's amazing. Just it's trying like to change probably, it up. No, this is like probably my favorite guest outfit anyone's ever worn. Thank you. <laughs> Eileen specializes in mental health and sex ed. Do you want to like, kind of like, what's your like rundown, I guess. on that? Yeah, I guess my spiel for people who aren't familiar. So yeah, I started on Tumblr, but originally I had a blog all around sexual health because I grew up really Catholic and with a single dad. And then from there, yeah, that's like what I did work wise. I used to go like speak at schools across the country and just like really hone in on the sex ed portion. And then I kind of just made a career out of being a crazy person. Like, <laughs> what do you mean a crazy just person? Just like a mental health. Like someone was oh. there. I got this message the other day that was like, so are you like a therapist or you're studying to be a therapist? And I'm like, no, no, I'm just a mentally ill person. <laughs> My stick online mm-hmm. is like being mentally ill. Um, no. So I just had this natural pivot in my life with my own mental health and struggles. And yeah, so I made this podcast during COVID. Mm-hmm. How did you choose like sexual health initially at the beginning? I think I chose it just because that's what was lacking in my life. Like mm-hmm. it was felt like from necessity, just like simple things like no one taught me how to shave my legs. Not that that's like sex ed, but yeah, that's just like, yeah, like hygiene, like women's but just health. like women's health or like I just grew up without a mom. Mm-hmm. So like I feel like there were a lot of things that, you know, I didn't have answers to. Yeah. So it really like propelled me into a situation in my life where I'm like, I want to get these answers for myself and also my friends and then other people who are in a situation similar who don't have someone to talk to. Mm-hmm. And then when did this kind of start? What age were you at when that kind of transpired? 16. Yeah, you were young. Cause I remember really like young. I saw that on Instagram, like saw you posting sex ed on Instagram. And I thought it was cool. Cause like you were like one of the few people that actually was sending out information you know, like a lot of people had followers and stuff like that, or like had like a certain thing that they were known for, but you were educating people, which I thought was cool. Like that's yeah, pretty, it was pretty fun. I mean, it's funny to look back cause I'm like, I was so young. So it's like, what do you really know at that age? Yeah. But like, it's also like, I like that because it's through the eyes of someone who's 16. Yeah. It's not like a trained professional who works at Harvard. It's like through exactly. a 16 year old girl figuring it out. So it has its own kind of I think essence. that's why it was successful or popular is yeah. because I didn't pretend to be something I, I wasn't it was like okay this is my experience like I would talk about having my boyfriend for the first time and like losing my virginity and hookup culture in high school and college and just talked about my experiences but also my friends and that's where it came from like I wasn't pretending to to know things I didn't Mm -hmm. I'm like you can go talk to a gynecologist talk to a doctor but like the experience you're gonna get asking your gyno about sex is really different than talking to a girlfriend yeah what about like your openness with like mental health like where did that kind of come from like kind of this need to like say or just be completely transparent with what you were going through like mentally I think for a long time I wasn't Mm -hmm. and that's what's so fascinating and toxic about social media is you can create like it's all kind of a facade Mm -hmm. and people put out like perfect versions of themselves and I just felt like that weighed really heavy on me like I almost felt like okay on the outside I look I seem like I'm successful and I'm making money and I have followers and I have like a hot boyfriend but on the inside I like always wanted to die Mm -hmm. so when I finally just like put it out there and I was like, I'm leaving, I'm going away for five months. I'm not going to have a phone. I've been really depressed and anxious. I just felt like this weight lifted off of my shoulders. Like I didn't have to pretend to be something I wasn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And I connected with a lot of people. Yeah. Like people reached out and were like, Oh my God, I also feel this way. And like selfishly, like it just made me feel a lot less alone. 
Do you share, like, this is coming from my own curiosity. You don't have to share this and we can like cut this out, but like, do you share your diagnosis as well? I do, but you do. literally recently. Recently, okay. And not, like, I haven't said it on a podcast really. Actually, technically I did say on a podcast like a, six months ago or a year ago. And then she did a whole episode around my diagnosis, mm -hmm. which whose, was fine. Whose podcast was it? This girl, Shannon Boudram. She has a pretty big podcast, okay. but she, I said, I have BPD, which is yeah. borderline, borderline pers personality. Yeah. And then she had a therapist on and did the second half of the episode as bipolar, which is completely wrong. Wait, what do you mean? She did the second half. She did because I had told her I have BPD. I mm -hmm. think she got confused and she thought I had bipolar. Well, that's a big confusion. <laughs> that's a completely I, different diagnosis. No. And that's she texted me before it came out being like, I'm so sorry. I really fucked up before it came out. She texted you. Yeah. And she was like, I fucked up. Like, I just want to let you know, like, I thought you had bipolar. So I had this therapist come on and talk about bipolar for like the half of the second half of the episode, which it's pretty to me exploitive, like is, is like, I wasn't mad. I was just like, to me, if I made that mistake, I would have scrapped it mm -hmm. or scrapped and put it out separately. Yeah. You could have like a total bipolar therapist talk and then you could have your episode. Those are just two different They're like content. Like you so that's different. Like a great another week you can have. Like, Slash I'm like, it's kind of stigmatizing to the act like they're similar or the same yeah. or to fuck that up. Like, honestly, I just wouldn't have even admitted it if I fucked that <laughs> up. I would have been scrapped it and made them separate episodes. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. I think when it happened, I was so nervous of the fact that I even put out my yeah. diagnosis that I was kind of like, okay, it's fine, whatever. People will like maybe think I'm bipolar, which mm -hmm. is more socially acceptable to be bipolar. Why do you think it's more socially acceptable? Because I think a lot of people... Um, believe and think that bipolar, like it's more acceptable that it's down to brain chemistry mm -hmm. and you can take like meds to manage it. Whereas borderline is a personality disorder and there's just like a lot more stigma for personality disorders. Mm -hmm. They're not as treatable. They're, I mean, they are treatable. It's way more difficult. There's a lot of stigma in the like medical community when it comes, when I first got diagnosed, my therapist literally told me, she was like, whatever you do, do not go home and Google it. Wait, why would she say that? That's she said there's so much misinformation mm -hmm. online about this disorder. That's just not true and really harmful. Oh my God, I've read the most fucked up shit. Like do not date someone who's borderline. Everyone who's borderline like deserves to die. Like they're horrible oh, like that people. Kind of testimonies. They have no empathy. Mm -hmm. They're so manipulative. They're abusive. They're toxic. They're fucking crazy. Like I've heard this even from people in my own life who didn't know oh, shit. that I was dealing with it. Actually, a friend of mine was talking about his sister has BPD, has no idea I had BPD at yeah. the time. And he was like, yeah, my sister's borderline. Like she's fucking crazy. Like she's actually fucking crazy. Yeah. And Shit. I was just sitting there like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And I've heard people even like mm -hmm. a, a good friend of mine, her, her mom has it. Yeah. I know a couple people and I've heard them say like really stigmatizing, not nice things about their mom. And then I'm sitting there like, whoa, I struggle with this. You know who else has it is Pete Davidson. He's doing just fine. You know a what lot, I mean? A lot of people have it and a lot of people get misdiagnosed as bipolar. Ha for having BPD. Yes. So majority of people who have been misdiagnosed are a lot of people who have a borderline or sorry, a bipolar diagnosis. Mm -hmm are actually BPD. Yeah. Where's the overlap like that you see? So I talked about this the other day actually is my understanding is that when you have bipolar, you are either manic or depressed for longer periods of times. Mm -hmm. Like they're not a swap. Like you can go months being depressed, staying in bed, not being able to get out of bed, not being able to shower. And then you can go like weeks or months of being in a manic state, especially if you're unmedicated. Mm -hmm. Borderline is really different. Like you essentially have like mood swings, but you can be extremely depressed one second mm -hmm. and then it can be relieved and you can be totally fine the next. Yeah. That's why it's very confusing and people get misdiagnosed a lot. Yeah. And like for me, even with my own struggles, it's really dependent on the situation, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like so your environment almost? My environment. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of environmental factors. So 
I could be in like a toxic relationship. And if my boyfriend's being mean to me, that can really trigger like an episode Mm -hmm. where maybe I seem like I'm really depressed or I seem like I'm kind of manic because I'm stressed out. And then if I'm removed from them or they're nice to me again, then I can be happy again. Like it's very dependent on these external factors. Yeah. What, what does an episode look like? Like when you're saying like Um, it could trigger that. I think it's different for everyone. I mean, I lived in a house with people with personality disorders yeah, and everyone it manifests very differently. For me, I am like not eating, not sleeping. If you're really stressed out, you can, you can be very paranoid almost to the point where you can like seem like you're like hallucinating mm-hmm. or manic. Okay. Um, so I've gone through periods, like if my relationship or if I'm really stressed out with work and I'm not taking care of myself mentally, then I'm like talking a million miles per hour. I can't sleep. Like, it seems like I'm just manic, Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. Are there meds for this or no? Like, so actually it's one of the only disorders where meds is not the first line of treatment. Okay. I do take meds. I take um, an SSRI, take Lexapro. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will play around with like mood stabilizers. Mm -hmm. You have to see what cocktail works for you. But the number one thing is therapy and talk therapy or what it's called DBT. So it's dialectical behavioral therapy. No, that's M B something. E that's E M T E M. EMDR, that's that's it. It is that. Wow. No, so DBT was actually created for people with borderline personality disorder. And it is behavioral therapy. So essentially, it's not just talk therapy, but you're learning skills to cope with like daily stressors. What would you say? Like, because I don't know this actually, like how does BPD manifest? Is it like through result of trauma and poor environment or is it? it so it's um, biological. And, yeah. So there's okay. there's a hundred percent a biological genetic component is what I learned at okay. McLean, which is this big hospital in Boston that I spent time at, which is like the leading hospital for BPD. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are in conjunction with Harvard medical school. It specializes in just BPD. No. Um, I would say it's like the top psychiatric hospital in like, it's one of the top ones in the world. Mm -hmm. Like basically they do all the research right there in Harvard medical school and it feeds right into the hospital, but they do have programs. Some of the leading programs for personality disorders, Mm -hmm. specifically BPD and, yeah, that's where some of these treatment programs were initially created in the 1980s. It wasn't even a diagnosis before the 80s. Okay. Um, And the borderline, the name borderline actually comes from borderline psychotic because they didn't know what it was. They were trying to figure out um, what these women were struggling with. Mm -hmm. It's really fucked up. They, and some people really believe they should change the name of the diagnosis. I don't really care that much. I'm like, whatever, fuck it. So do you think that (laughs) you're not quite crazy, but you're damn, you're you're borderline (laughs) crazy. (laughs) Well, cause they're, cause I think, fuck, I, you know, women, they were coming in and they weren't like just depressed, but they weren't psychotic. So Mm -hmm. it was kind of like, okay, what's this other thing? And then they figure it out. And now there's all this new research, but essentially it's, yes, there's a genetic component where you have a predisposition. Mm -hmm. So you are just more at odds to potentially develop one of these disorders. And then most of the time due to environmental factors, whether you grew up in a neglectful house, you had some sort of trauma. A lot of people with BPD have had sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, Not everyone. That's a misconception. There are some people who just develop it and maybe they have no trauma at all. And have no trauma. Interesting. Um, But I would say there, how I understand it and have been told is it's kind of the dance between the two. Okay. Cause, cause then it would be the same argument to me as uh, bipolar. If you're just genetically born with it, then it is your brain chemistry. Right. But I don't know if you're genetically born, you like come out of the womb with borderline. Yeah. I think it's more like it develops as a reaction to your surroundings, mm-hmm. but you had this disposition of like, for me, And this really helped me with my diagnosis is I have an over, so people with BPD have an overactive amygdala Mm -hmm. and an underactive prefrontal cortex. So your amygdala 
Let me look this up so I don't mm-hmm. fuck it up. <laughs> okay, so your amygdala is like the part of your brain that's involved with experiencing emotions. Okay. So you have an overactive amygdala, which means that like, heightened emotion yeah, okay you're heightened emotionally just like in terms of brain chemistry yeah and then the prefrontal cortex is where you like i think you rationalize and you make decisions so mm-hmm. it's kind of the things of like i'm not going to jump off this bridge because that's dangerous yeah if your prefrontal cortex is um is the brain region that is in plant planning complex cognitive behavior personal expression decision making and moderating social behavior Mm -hmm. so like i could technically stand up right now and like punch you in the face (laughs) but i'm not gonna do that yeah but that's my prefrontal cortex you know being like okay i'm not gonna get up and do this thing but if you have you know it's not like down to brain chemistry it's not as active then when you get heightened emotionally it's hard to not act on those emotions. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not like a normal person. Mm -hmm. So something may affect me way more than it affects you, even though like, I don't know, something small. Let me think of an example off the top of my head, but like, I don't know, you shat, like this is my table and I love this table and you break my table. Yeah. Like you may be like, oh, it's fine. I'll buy you a new table. But to me, that could really affect me emotionally. Okay. Like, does that make sense? Yeah. They always say like borderline people are like burn victims. Okay. And so it's just like anything you touch. Like them, very sensitive. They're very sensitive. Okay. Yeah. And is that kind of what they will like back to the, like, is that what they teach you in therapy of like how to kind of moderate that? Or like, yes. what are they teaching you? So that's you? exactly it. It's okay. all of these skills, like physical skills that they've studied and done all these studies and research on of like when I'm having a panic attack or like one of the diagnoses or the criteria to be diagnosed is that you're very suicide. You have a lot of suicidal thoughts, Mm -hmm. ideation, people self harm who have borderline. And so they'll teach you skills of like in the moment when my brain's telling me like, I want to die, I don't want to be here. And then that's where people will like overdose or I don't know, have any type of suicidal mm-hmm. behavior. They teach you things to calm you down in that moment, to like take a breath. So mm-hmm. there's literally this skill called the stop skill. Mm-hmm. And it's super simple, but it's like stop everything you're doing and just like take a fucking breath and then reevaluate how you feel. And then there's things like dumping your face in ice water, which I'm sure you've seen on TikTok. That's mm-hmm. a DBT skill. Okay. And it slows your heart rate down. So I don't know. It's really interesting. Have you like, has this helped this, these kinds of like, my God, I, so I stayed there for five months and I have not had like one suicide, maybe like a couple suicidal, like (laughs) thoughts, you know, you're like like, just a couple, but I'm just saying in terms (laughs) of like how I was struggling before, like I'm a different person. That's awesome. And even my therapist told me like, I had this really awful situation with my ex-boyfriend like five months ago. And she was like, if this same situation had happened before you came to McLean, you would be in the hospital right now. Yeah. And, and it's true. And we were talking and like, I was really upset and texting her. And that's also another part of DBT is the therapists are usually like t- available 24 mm-hmm. seven. And so I can call her when I'm in crisis. Yeah. But she was like, I just want you to take like a moment and realize how far you've come because you'd probably be sitting in the psych ward yeah for this evening because this situation would make you so upset yeah and I was upset but I could handle being upset whereas before I felt like I didn't have any tools to handle it is there like an achievable goal to live kind of a normal life eventually totally and so there's actually studies that show women specifically by the time they reach more middle age a lot of the time even if they don't get treatment their BPD tends to go into remission. Oh, interesting. And that's just because your life usually tends to stabilize. So if you get married, you know, you have kids or you have like a full itinerary of things to do, Mm -hmm. it kind of, yeah, dissipates. But I think for people who their lives don't tend to stabilize, like let's say they never get married or Mm -hmm. they get divorced or they're in these tumultuous relationships, then I think it It can stay for, continues. Interesting. I like how like there's almost like a time limit for BPD. That's fascinating. Yeah. And th- and that's a big part of it too. Mm-hmm. So like, let me just read you the nine criteria because it's nine criteria of what? Of, bo- to, of to be diagnosed. Okay. You, so you have to meet, I think it's six or seven of them to be diagnosed. Okay. And one of them is all about identity. 
It's lack of self sense of self, isn't it? Is one of them, yeah. Because I remember, I I'm really interested in psychology. I find it so fascinating. I when the Amber Heard trial was coming up and she had borderline. Obviously, she's not like the best fucking poster for borderline, but I guess she does have it. But um, but see, I feel conflicted on that. that what's they, like yeah? What's because your thoughts? them bringing it up in the trial to me is like trying to be like, oh, she's crazy. So mm-hmm. let me bring up this diagnosis and stigmatize it even more by being like, she has this disorder. So like clearly she she made this up or yeah. did these things because she's yeah. borderline like borderline literally just gets associated with being fucking crazy and i'm like i've definitely had moments of being fucking crazy i don't really think i'm that crazy like mm-hmm. usually there's a reason for why i get so activated yeah. it's not out of nowhere and honestly if you like learned a little bit more about my history and like my childhood it's it's pretty fucking like it makes sense why mm-hmm. people develop this it's um it's a defense mechanism yeah it's like, it's like people who have narcissism, for example. Yeah. And I did an episode on this with someone who studies nar- NPD at McLean and it gets so thrown around in the media and I hear it on podcasts and I see these doctors come on and they're so quick to be like, yeah, that celebrity is a narcissist. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, but no, no ethical doctor who hasn't met with that person themselves would be like throwing around diagnoses mm-hmm. o- online. Um, and a lot of people who have NPD, again, it- NPD? Ha- NPD is narcissistic personality oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. disorder. And it's like a really painful disorder that people struggle with. And it's, it is a lack of empathy and you have these things, but a lot of the time they came from really fucked up homes, like super abusive situations. It's almost a way neglect. Um, and again, genetics play a part and it's kind of the same thing of like, Oh, if someone was really neglectful or abusive, I need to take care of me to the point that like, I can't survive if I'm thinking about other people's needs. It's like a survival instinct and then it just programs into your brain and that's how you live your life. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. I have been going to therapy since I was a little kid uh, because of my behavioral issues. So I am not shy when it comes to therapy and I am a total advocate for therapy. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and has helped match 3 million people professionally with licensed therapists and they are available 100% online. I really recommend BetterHelp for an easy kind of first step into therapy. If you're thinking about therapy, if you don't know where to go, go to BetterHelp slash good and evil to get your 10% off your first month and just try it. I am such a huge proponent of therapy and I think therapy has completely changed my life. I go once a week and it's amazing for me there's a brief questionnaire to match you with a therapist and you can always switch which is nice and there's no waiting rooms no traffic no anything it is just at your home and you can do it whenever you want i think this is a great service that is being able to be offered to us so go to betterhelp slash good and evil for 10 percent off your first month that's betterhelp h-e-l-p dot com slash good and evil for 10 percent off What makes a person a murderer? Are they born to kill or were they made to kill? Killer Psych Daily is a new podcast that gives you a quick 10 minute rundown every weekday on the motivations and behaviors of a criminal mastermind, psychopaths and cold blooded killers that you read about in the news. I am obsessed with psychoanalyzing everybody in my life, including the dark forces around me. I find it very interesting. And if you're anything like me and you're obsessed with dark people and dark minds, which I think is pretty common, you should definitely check out this podcast. Hosted by Candace DeLong, it draws her years of ex- FBI agent and criminal profiler experience to break down the cases for you on Killer Psych Daily. Candace will give you insight into cases like Ryan Gritham and the Stockholm serial killer. She will also invite expert guests to dive deeper into details, share what it's like to work at Quantico, and answer some killer trivia. And even host virtual Q&A as that will allow her to ask and answer questions. Hey, Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, Killer Psych Daily in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. Have you ever felt like you want to watch TV shows in another country but don't know how? Well, Surfshark has your back for that exact reason, which is pretty badass if you really think about it. I love a company that is willing to, you know, be a little edgy about things. Surfshark is also extremely easy to use. I do not know how to use like any software, pretty much like ads whatsoever. 
So this was extremely easy for me to set up and use, which is awesome because I am not someone that has an easy time learning these kinds of new internet things. Surfshark makes it extremely easy. Not only just watching Netflix and Hulu or whatever in different countries and being able to access entertainment, you are also able to get past geo blocks and government restrictions, change your virtual location, and secure yourself online. Stay safe on public Wi-Fi. Send or receive files securely. Get the best deals when shopping online. Surfshark is your virtual hacking system that is completely easy and customer friendly to use. I suggest you try it out if you haven't before. My favorite thing about Surfshark, I think, is compared to other services trying to do this, Surfshark doesn't have any viruses and it is completely consumer friendly. I remember back in the day before Surfshark was around and you'd have to kind of be kind of sketchy when wanting to watch UK Love Island. I would get tons of viruses on my computer trying to do this exact same thing. So Surfshark makes it easy. So there's a fire sale at Surfshark. If you go to Surfshark, dot deals slash charlotte enter promo code charlotte for the first 83 percent off the first extra three months free so check this out at surfshark you have literally nothing to lose and let me know how you guys enjoy it i am currently watching some great uk tv shows that i did not have the pleasure of watching over here so thank you surfshark I have empathy for all people who struggle with mental illness. I think people a lot of the times are just a victim of their own mind. I think that's like true. And <clears throat> especially people like, like we know people with like narcissistic personality disorders and stuff like that, um, or even worse. And it all comes from, it was, they were bred to almost be this kind of heart heartless person at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And like, there's, there's people that we know that just don't feel anything for anybody. And it's because no one felt anything for them. And they've just learned to protect themselves in this way of, um, it's just like, there was no moderate, like nothing moderating them to make like, to change or to not, you know, have like a genetic disposition to narcissism or whatever it is. Totally. Um, but I also think you have to want to change. Yeah, that's you true. You know, and I think everyone has the opportunity to. And the reason that NPD is actually like one of the most difficult disorders to treat is because you have to feel a level of like guilt or embarrassment over your actions to then yeah. change them. So it's difficult to treat with like trained professionals and doctors, because a lot of the time they, they are don't, not going in, they're not going in slash. They don't think like something's wrong with them. Something's wrong with them or their life is like fucked up enough or they're hurting people. Like they don't have that, that empathy to feel what it's like to hurt someone to yeah. then want to change. The understanding isn't there. I was talking to my psychiatrist and they like, I think it was a couple of years ago. And I was like, so worried I was going to become a narcissist for some reason. Like he like laughed and was like, you're never going to become a narcissist. Like, don't worry about it. But he was like, by the way, no narcissist would be in here. He's like, it's just true. He's like, no sociopath would be in here unless it's court ordered or unless I'm doing it with marriage counseling. He's like, they just wouldn't. None of them would want to be here. None of them feel that there's anything that they need to fix with themselves mm -hmm. unless it's court ordered. He's like, that's the only time I see narcissists or sociopaths here. And it's true. That is interesting. And like, even to the point, like it comes down to like personal accountability a little bit, you know? Totally. Like you and can we have know a, those you, people. Yeah. Like and, you, we, and you make like great strides to like better yourself. That's like literally all you can ask someone to do. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't like people have like a fucked up situation or they have predisposed, like pre exposed, like mental illness in their family and they're more like at risk to get this. But as long as they're like trying, you know, to be a better citizen, that's like all you can really ask. I think somebody. that's like my whole shtick these days or my mission is like showing people that like you can change. There are amazing tools and help available to live a better life. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, if you talk to me four years ago, like I genuinely did not want to be here anymore. I was like, I have an amazing life, but I'm not grateful for it because I feel like I'm in pain all the time and I'm not happy. I'm like really miserable. And now I feel like at a point where like, yeah, of course that still comes up and it's something I'm going to struggle with for the rest of my life. But I have seen such a huge difference. Like if I put in that effort and I try to have help mm -hmm. or find help, then yeah, I can live a better life. Like the yeah. help is available. Yeah. I kind of love parts of it. Like it's made me a way <laughs> more that. emotional person. Yeah. Like what, I know he's really controversial right now, Who? Kanye. 
Is he? He doesn't have borderline, does he? I thought no. he's bipolar. Right? He's bipolar. Yeah. I think he's borderline. I wouldn't be surprised because his mood swings seem to seem like so. Yeah. Like when he gets stressed out, it doesn't feel like long periods of time. Who knows? I don't know him personally, yeah. but um, he said that thing about bipolar being like a superpower for him, mm -hmm. and that's one thing I I do like that he said yeah. because I feel that way with my BPD. I feel like it's allowed me to be way more empathetic. I feel like it's also allowed me to like be emotional and be able to talk about these things, connect with people online, fans, start my podcast. Mm -hmm. Like a, a lot of that I think comes from this ability. I also love really hard. And mm -hmm. I think that's a part of the BPD. I mean, there's certain things that I'm like, yes, of course I would love to like, hello, give me a brain transplant. <laughs> give me a lobotomy. Do you actually ever feel that, that way sometimes? Like yeah. Damn. Not so much anymore, mm -hmm. but really in the past when I felt like I couldn't control my like sadness yeah, or I couldn't control my anxiety. What? Yeah. I wanted to, um, I'm like, I can't live with it, L live like this anymore. So like my doctor said, there's so much misinformation online. So mm -hmm. I'm really particular about where I'm going to read stuff from. Yeah. So like I literally went to McLean's website, um, and I'm looking up BPD. So BPD is a complex condition. Okay. Uh, we're going to give a little ASMR. <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. Um, so it affects how a person feels about themselves and others. And so it's characterized by intense, unstable emotions and relationships, as well as insecurity and self-doubt. So it makes everything about a person feel unstable, ranging from their moods, thinking, behavior, relationships, sometimes identity. People with this condition have been described as the feeling of having an exposed nerve ending or being a burn victim, okay. essentially leaving someone to be easily triggered by very small things. Almost like an open wound kind yes. of thing. Okay. Correct me if this is wrong, but I went down like a huge BPD wormhole a couple of years ago mm -hmm. just because I was fascinated in different um, like personality. Just I honestly, any sort of psychological anything, I'll probably do some sort of research on it because I find it interesting. But it said that. 80%, again, correct me if I'm wrong, don't know if this is right, but it said around 80% of people with BPD are likely to have something else as well. Oh yeah, but that's every disorder. And oh, that's something that? I okay. learned at McLean is I was told that people who just have BPD, this is from the director of the program at McLean. Like she's like the top gun. She teaches at Harvard. And she said that you are a unicorn if you just have yeah. one disorder. And that's just how, like a lot of them are comorbid mm -hmm. or- they occur at the same time. And that's just like how your brain develops. Yeah. But so that then is maybe true. Kanye has too then. And you know? the majority of men who have BPD are in prison. Interesting. It's really fucked up. Cause it makes them volatile or what is it? Yeah. For? It makes you aggressive and volatile. And I think with women, sometimes just like we live in a society where like maybe, you know, Oh, she's a crazy woman, but like, mm -hmm. Like some things that I've watched people do who have BPD or even myself have done, like I'm like, if I was a guy, I would probably like get in way more trouble. Mm -hmm. Like even just certain things of like going through a partner's phone. Like mm -hmm. I just feel like you can kind of practice toxic or like abusive behavior and there's more leniency if you're yeah. a woman slash you're an attractive woman. Yeah. Like there's also, <laughs> there's like this some kind of article I saw that was like men are really attracted to like a hot woman with BPD are like <laughs> supposedly. I totally believe no that. No, and like, that no, but, <laughs> but like even like in, even in like Hollywood, like if you deep dive on like a lot of actresses who like they, people think have BPD, it's like Angelina Jolie, like all these people. I mean, even Amber Heard, she was married to Johnny Depp. Like, like that's I think like people the like, biggest like, actor, you know, like he could have gotten anyone he chose he Amber Heard. Them. Yeah. No, liked, I think, yeah, I think people it. do like the crazy, but it's not even so much the crazy as it is like it's intense emotion. It's people in my experience who like love really hard and aren't afraid to say what they feel. And like maybe they come on really strong, really fast. And, you know, there's it's like multifaceted. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that is like hot and it's exciting. Yeah. Um, OK, so some of the criteria is so yeah to be okay to be officially diagnosed a person has to exhibit five or more of these and there's nine okay so instability in relationships so this is intense and short-lived relationships are common for people with bpd it's very common for someone with this disorder to have intense unstable relationships filled with drastic quick 
quick changing feelings. So this could be friendships. It Mm -hmm. could be romantic. It could be with your family and it's called the splitting, but basically we could be hanging out every day. Is it the black and whiteness? Yes. So you're super black and white is just how your thinking is. And you could do one thing. And if I could interpret it as like, wow, you really hurt me on purpose and then cut you out. So that's really common. And I've seen that even with friends of mine who have BPD, it's, can be difficult to maintain longstanding relationships, friendships, um, because I, of that black yeah. and white thinking. I, I have black and white thinking. I don't have BPD, but I have friends with BPD and I will talk with them about this specific splitting trait that we both have. I have this hundred percent. Yeah. It's like one person does maybe even like a small thing. That's not that big of a deal. Like, Hey, I can't make it to dinner tonight. Yeah. Like I have to study And then I could interpret as like, wow, if they cared enough about me, especially Mm -hmm. if I'm not doing well and I'm stressed out, then I'm much more sensitive to it. Now I've learned with this type of therapy and skills and like I eat well and I take my medication that I'm not as susceptible to react to react to certain things like I used to be when I was kind of undiagnosed, untreated. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's interpreting something as like they flaked on me. Yeah, they flaked on me for dinner. So like, fuck them. And yeah, so you split. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a really big part of BPD. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is one of them. Another one is extreme emotional swings. So someone, so you experience unstable moods and emotions. Um, the little things that don't mean much to others, like someone not holding the door open for you can be very frustrating. (laughs) Like I, interesting. So their moods are also very intense and this can last anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours. And okay. so that's where I mean, it's very different than bipolar. Okay. But if you're meeting someone like shorter, essentially, yeah, it's just shorter yeah. and it can switch more at the flick of a wrist. Whereas bipolar, it's like months, it can be months. It could be weeks. Um, and I think it's more like, yeah, your brain chemistry is just like, you're depressed for a while or mm-hmm. you're manic. Okay. Explosive feelings of anger. Okay. Many anger pe- specifically. Interesting. Many people with BPD struggle with intense anger and a short temper. This makes it difficult for them to feel in control of their emotions once they've been provoked. That like leads me to qu- like think like if you people with BPD who struggled with no trauma, I'm like, what would they be? Obviously everyone can be angry about anything, but if you have like a general like good childhood and like two parents that like But I think it's your brain you. chemistry. So it's just yeah. like something like, you know, someone cuts you off in traffic. Maybe I a see. normal person would be like, okay, fuck you asshole, but not do anything. But because your, your brain brain, like your prefrontal cortex or your emotions in your Mm -hmm. brain go like a hundred miles per hour, you're way more, you know, you're going to react and be like, like that could be really upsetting. Yeah. It could like make you cry or you could be like, fuck what the actual fuck and like get in some road rage thing. It also says those sometimes this can be directed either outward or it can be directed inward. Mm -hmm. So that's in connection to self-harm. Okay. Like I said, it can manifest really differently for some people. So some people could be like, yeah, maybe they're angry at themselves and externally they just look like they keep to themselves more, but they're like cutting themselves and they just Mm -hmm. feel like a lot of shame. Yeah. So it's not necessarily you're like running around punching everyone. But I think again, that has to do with why guys end up in jail. Yeah. So self-harm is another one of the criteria. And this just includes risky behavior in general. So binge drinking, cutting, gambling, gambling, spending sprees, shopping, unsafe sex, drug use. Um, And not all self-harm is intended to end in death. It's usually as a way to get through a moment of you feeling really bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then lingering feelings of emptiness. Mm -hmm. So this is a big one and one I felt was like a really big light bulb off when I read this initially before I got diagnosed. Um, light bulb meaning like you resonated with it yes. kind of thing? Okay. Um, is that many people with BPD report feeling like there's just a void inside of them. And so as this, a result, they yeah. will turn to drugs, food, sex to kind of feel satisfied. Like it's just something yeah. about them in their daily life just feels like empty. This is when I, when I was like kind of like teaching myself about borderline when I read that symptom, that's what made me be like, this is just genuinely like heartbreaking to me, to be honest, because like who, like I would never, I would love to take that like pain away from people. And like just knowing people with borderline, that's like a very tough thing to deal with forever. Yeah. And I think that's why I try to talk about it because Mm -hmm. there's so much, so many misconceptions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've even had boyfriends say like really fucked up things. Even like my family have said just like they don't when people are 
uneducated about something, they make ignorant comments. Yeah. And you can't really blame them. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. There's more people. Um, feeling. Okay. So paranoia. So struggling with mm -hmm. paranoia or suspicion. So they tend to feel suspicious about events in their lives. Um, they can when under extreme stress, you can lose touch with reality and become dissociated. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're spaced out, you're foggy, or as if you're outside of your body. And so this is, I think, when you can get misdiagnosed as other things as well. And why did that not give me nine? Excuse <laughs> me? That was not nine. Okay. Let's do you go. relate to all of them or do you relate to so a handful of them? When I went in, I was nine for nine. Stop. They told me my therapist <laughs> at the program, like when I first met her, she was like, you are a poster child. Mm -hmm. Like I was literally nine That's for funny. nine. I would say I'm probably like, Honestly, I haven't read through these in a while, but like five now. now. Yeah. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, like, please. But that's like what like steers everything in BPD, isn't it? Like this, this kind of core feeling of being fear of abandonment. Kind I think of like fear of abandonment, but also the emptiness, which is a separate yeah. one. Okay. So number one is frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Okay. Two, a pattern of unstable and intense relationships. And these are characterized by you alternate between extreme idealization and devaluation. Yeah. So you'll like put a boyfriend or your mom or your best friend on a pedestal and be like, they can do no wrong. I love them. And then as soon as they disappoint you, which we're human and people Happens can't be perfect yeah. always, then you devalue and it's like, fuck you. You, you were fucking bitch. You were out yeah. to get me. You took advantage of me. Um, so that's really hard. And you, it's also hard when you have, like, there are many years of my life where I'm like, I know on some level I'm being insane. Mm -hmm. And I know that this isn't real. Like I know what my boyfriend did or what my best friend did, like, isn't reason for me to end this friendship, mm -hmm. but it just feels so intense. And I yeah. feel so betrayed. I think a lot of people could relate to that almost, you know, that feeling specifically of like, I know, like I'm kind of acting irrational, but like, I can't help it. Yes. Kind of thing. That's exactly you know? how I felt for yeah. years. I'm like, I know cognitively what I'm struggling with, but I don't know how to change it. Yeah. Okay. So identity disturbance. So persistently unstable self image or sense of self. Okay. And this is really funny to me, this one, just to see how it manifests for different people. Because that, that is interesting because to you, to me, like, cause I know other people with BPD and like you specifically to me, I would say have more of a sense of self, like you specifically only because you have like certain things that like are kind of like like specific to you, you have like your own style. Like a lot of people just like, you have your own things that you find interesting that like, you just like have things that are kind of like authentically Eileen, which you, you know what I mean? So it's like almost like you have kind of a little bit more of a sense of self in some ways than I would say other people do even without BPD. You know what yeah, I mean? definitely. I, I just will say though, I still feel like I struggled with them. This no, one, sure especially well. like yeah. in relationships mm -hmm. with like boyfriends. Um, and I think it was so tied to the not wanting to be abandoned that I would almost take on sometimes like the things that my boyfriend liked to do mm -hmm. or their interests. Yeah. Um, but I'll see this with people like the way that they dress, they'll start, and you know, people like this too, they'll mm -hmm. start hanging out with a new friend group and then they like completely change their yeah. look and their hair. Yeah. Um, and to me that feels very like they're confused about their identity, yeah. especially if they're switching it all the time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, I used to change my hair color. Like literally I would dye it blue when I was stressed out. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Impulsivity in at least two areas that are self-damaging. So that's spending, sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating. Okay. Um, and to me, definitely like I love doing drugs and I love shopping mm -hmm. as a way to relieve anxiety. Yeah. Recurrent What's suicidal. Drugs? I didn't know you were like. In drugs? Yeah. Like. Oh, but, I mean, I know, obviously honey, I, I know, tried like, everything. <laughs> I used to take a lot of pills okay. as like, a way to relieve my anxiety. anxiety pills. I would take Xanax that okay. I would buy from a dealer. Like mm -hmm. I didn't have it prescribed. I would self-medicate Percocet. Interesting. I was much more of a downers girl. I used to do a lot of Molly and like 
ecstasy in high school when I was really young. It just felt like, and that's why I like ketamine too, because I like anything that dissociates where I'm like, I'm just taking a break from my brain for yeah. like an hour. Yeah. Um, and I hate, I don't do cocaine, but I've tried it. I don't like uppers because it makes me like more anxious slash that's why I didn't drink for a long time because I'm a much more impulsive person. I mean, mm-hmm. you've been around me. I'll literally like take my clothes off you on sunset. You are fucking hilarious when <laughs> like we're I'm out. Like I'm fun. No, and she's I- literally like one of the, f- I have like, the. I, this is just a quick story of Eileen when we were out one night. We were at Sunset Tower. It was, who else was there? Was it Alex from Call Her Daddy? Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, and oh my Walker, God. And Walker, my friend Walker. And Walker and Delilah. Yeah. It was, there was three girls with the podcast. Delilah, our friend Delilah and Walker. Um, and I lean every single person that walked by her table. She would go, Oh my God. Oh my God. New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve. I met you on New Year's Eve. And the person's like this, like beautiful girl is like trying to talk to them. And they're like, yeah, like what on New Year's Eve? Like, totally. and Eileen's like fully running with this story. Every single person that crosses by on her table. After we got to a certain point where all of us were so mortified by this. Like we literally were just, our heads were down and we were like, oh my God, not another person. I think there was one person that was like, I don't know you. And the rest were like totally feeding into this story that Eileen was feeding them. Eileen also got up on the table and was like twerking. Like, no, I don't. You don't remember? No, I, I mean, it was know. amazing. I like literally well, I was just actually like, took off my clothes on sunset. No, that was amazing. I posted that I know. Well, birthday. I just like pulled up my thing and I was like in a thong. But then I did, I did say something really rude to the manager. At, oh, what's such Chateau Marmont? I know I, he, I got in trouble for that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Cause I, cause I had filmed like a, like a, like a creative movie there with Luca and Duke. And so I was there all summer. So the staff knew me really well. And then Eileen goes up to the person and was like, you, they wouldn't let us in or something. We were meeting like our friend Brett and Eileen just said, um, well, you have a small dick. So, <laughs> <laughs> and he lost it. He literally was like, get the fuck off my property. And he was like, I'm sorry, but like you and your friends have to go. I know, I know. Which is funny. Cause I'm like, it's obviously true. Like if he, if he had a big dick, he wouldn't have been offended by that. I was just like, so sloshed. My be real just went off. <laughs> But that's what I mean in terms of like, uh, that's the impulsive behavior, I think, yeah. because I'm already a pretty like loose lipped or impulsive just because my brain chemistry that when I drink or I'm on substances, it becomes more. And that's where like when I was younger and I didn't know what worked for me or didn't work for me, I would get myself into trouble a lot. Mm-hmm. But that's why I like downers because it chills me out. Yeah. Like when I do other stuff, then I'm like, fuck, I wake up the next morning. I'm like, what absolutely insane thing did I do last night? Yeah. Who did I like push or. No, yeah, you're, you're a true like like different kind of spirit. And this is honestly in like the ways where I kind of love it. Like, it's like, I always say to people, like when I, I always talk about how special I think you are and so rare, I think you're truly such a rare person. And like, I just never met anyone like you in my life. And like in the best way, like truly, I always say that like anyone that's ever I've talked to, I think I was talking to like, uh, who was, I was talking to my friend Riley about you. I was just like, Eileen is just like truly one of a kind. And like, I just think you're like one of the most rare girls I've ever met. Stop, I love you. No, I'm being serious. I, I do know, not I'm say not, that. I don't, I don't think you're trying to butter my muffin. No, I, I'm being serious. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm very sincere with what I, what words I use with people. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So anyways, yeah, just, I know that was a lot about BPD, but I just want to tell your listeners that yeah. it is real and like, it is a brain disorder and And I don't feel like shame. I mean, there definitely, I do have some internalized shame still, but I'm working through it and talking about it openly helps me combat that. Yeah. No, it's nice for, I think in the last like two years, people have been talking about BPD a lot more online because it wasn't really, I didn't know what it was, honestly. I didn't know about it until four years ago when a friend of mine got diagnosed. That's how I found out. That's how you found out what it was. Yeah. I was trying to support her reading about it and I was like, hold on a second. Yeah. I was like, why do I relate to literally (laughs) all of this? Damn. But I I would say I don't really relate to all of it anymore. Yeah. What don't you relate to now? What do you feel like has gone away? I do feel like I still deal with emptiness. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I have intense or inappropriate anger at all. And that would really only be in like my romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. That's why I always felt like such a split person too. I always had these really amazing, healthy, awesome friendships for the most part. And then my romantic relationships were always really toxic, Mm -hmm. kind of abusive, like crazy town. Yeah. Just would feel like 
angry in them or be with people that I knew I shouldn't be with. Mm -hmm. But because I was so afraid of being alone and being abandoned, I would stay in the relationship for a lot longer. Um, I can definitely feel paranoid if I'm stressed out, but I haven't been stressed out lately. I don't feel like I'm impulsive unless I'm drinking, really, okay. to be honest. That's also pretty normal with people just drinking in general, whether you have BPD or not. Exactly. You know? So yeah. it just exasperates it. Yeah. That's why I just have to be careful. Um, and I do feel like I probably still struggle a bit with identity disturbance. Even like doing podcasts or getting to a point in career, I'm always having like, is this what I want to do? Do yeah. I want to do something else? And I think mm -hmm. that's a normal human thought process yeah but it feels like it's on another level so yeah just second guessing myself and i'm pretty insecure mm -hmm. same <laughs> hey guys instead of giving you guys a three-hour podcast with eileen i decided to put it into two parts i could not cut anything from this podcast because i genuinely loved every single moment of it that is why specifically this will be in two parts that is one of my most favorite conversations i've had so far which is why exclusively this will be put into two parts tune into that episode on tuesday november 15th